the, the idea behind this is, you know, we heard all about, you know, the app stores taking over, a lot of these startups not coming here for business or only just for some awareness. And we were wondering two or three things, or like when we invited these people. We have Stefan, who's in Kenya. We have uh, Diane, who is in, um, in Israel and, and is part of a very global, successful startup. And we have two ecosystem players, right? And we were wondering, like, you know, are app stores making everybody equal? Or is this really just a Silicon Valley orientated opportunity? Do you need to be there as a startup? And the question is like, if, you know, the partnerships need to change in these days, like how do you need the partnerships with the other e ecosystem players look like? And what kind of value do they need to bring in? Mike, can you take it over? Sure. Hello everyone. I'm Mike Butcher from TechCrunch. And uh, clearly Matt has decided to torture me because um, TechCrunch is known very well for being a obsessed Silicon Valley blog <laughs> in a massive bubble. We love to talk about our own stuff all the time and forget that there's uh, this other place called the rest of the world. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so I'm supposed to be here to, and luckily I'm British, so that there, I've, I've, I've worked out that there is somewhere else other than San Francisco. Um, and uh, so what we're going to be talking about is all that stuff that's happening out there. And, um, uh, and the, sort of where, where does innovation come from? Basically, it comes from everywhere now, basically. So how are these big companies like Telefonica, et cetera, going to deal with that? It's coming from everywhere. Uh, you know, the level of the playing field now is pretty level now with that, the App Store situation, that kind of that whole environment. Um, I, was in, I was in Moscow recently and uh, two uh, twin brothers uh, a couple of guys who came up with the cut the rope uh, game, and uh, they're two crazy Moscovites. Um, nobody knew that was the, you know, two young guys, and it just became a huge app uh, game success. So, um, so that so how these big companies do this, and also what are these uh, our eminent panelists doing in their uh, environments. So, let's start right at the at the end. <coughs> Uh, and uh, uh, let's have a little general introduction from everyone quickly about what you're, th what you're thinking, what you're doing. Go. Oh, what I'm doing or what I'm thinking? <laughs> <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of everything. I think, um, so uh, I work within uh, Octal Lucent, 70,000 person company. Um, and if you think about it, uh, the bigger you get, the harder it is to innovate. Um, for a variety of reasons, you get a lot of, um, you get quote a lot of legacy products and things that have been around for a long time that one-off customers have. But the customers are so big, right? If Telefonica has some of my, you know, equipment there, if I want to go change it out, it takes a while to do that, um, and it takes a while to, to to innovate on it. And I think what happens is there's a combination of um, uh, in a big company, there's a combination of budgets, which is different than getting VC money with a budget; they can take it away. <laughs> VC money, they don't really take it away; they just don't give you more, right? So you know what your time window is to succeed. Um, I think other things around innovation to think about uh, globally for big companies is also this um, this notion of they all want to right. So it's it's how do they how do they innovate in a in a better faster way? And there's a great book called The Other Side of Innovation, and I encourage people to read it because it talks about merging sort of legacy with new, and then also not funding projects long enough to take off and be successful. Great. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, Tracy uh, Telefonica. Now, by the way, we, we've decided we're not going to uh, uh, revisit the beating up of carriers debate uh, on this panel. Um, we, we could have a go. But we, uh, we, we'll, we'll try. We'll try and steer, steer clear of that. And what I'm quite interested in Telefonica is you guys are coming up with different kind of takes on things. Basically, mm -hmm. for instance, you're coming up with this new thing called Wayra, which is you're incubating startups. Uh, do you want to, uh, and, and tell us a, what else well, you guys are doing. Well, I'll just talk a little bit more about Telefonica Digital because yeah. that was the whole concept, and I think it it, it, it it builds on your point that actually it's very difficult in large organisations to innovate. And, and I think what Telefonica decided is we fundamentally had to take away the old from the new and separate the new business out to allow the new businesses that we'd acquired and also the new areas that we want to enter into to be treated in a different way to the core business. And there's lots of challenges in the core business. We talked about it heavily, you know, and, and the core business is, is really looking at how can we do things more efficiently and how can we con continue to provide customer service and all of the things we need to do. But Telefonica Digital is about how can we start to find new ways of doing things. and. 
There's a number of things we're doing. We've got verticals that are looking for new businesses. And one of the big strands of that is how can we find new businesses to invest in and help us find innovation all around the world. Um, quite importantly, Teleponica Digital is headquartered in London rather than in, in Spain. Um, and is a global organization with offices in Tel Aviv, uh, in, in Sao Paulo, in Madrid, and in Silicon Valley, which is where I'm based. Um, and we really think that it's very important that we see those places as giving us a window on what we should be looking at rather than looking at our traditional competitors uh, and the other carriers. Um, so you're basically looking for things that are going to come up and bite you uh, that might, uh, that, that, uh, you know, you can't sort of look at Verizon or something and go, you know, watch those guys like a hawk. There's something else happening out there. Exactly, exactly. In fact, you know, almost Verizon, AT&T and all of us should be collaborating to think about what we can do against the competitors Good luck with that. that are truly, yeah, yeah uh, Good luck and, that and that is a very interesting challenge that we won't go into now. Um, but one of the things, one of the areas, just to sort of answer your question, that we're looking at is investments. And I look after venture capital investments within, within Silicon Valley, looking for strategic corporate investments. But actually, there are two other strands to our investment strategy, one of which is called WIRA, which is re really an incubator, where we're looking at, in the countries that we operate, how could we help some of the entrepreneurs who actually may not want to all be in Silicon Valley, and actually are very much more related to some of the challenges we have in our different global countries. How can we help them to innovate? So we've established, I think, now eight WIRA uh, venues within the last eight months. They have premises that are specific to them. We invest small amounts in the business, and we also give them technology support. And I would say so far it's going very well, um, and, and I think it's been a, a big success for us. Uh, we also invest directly into some venture capital funds, so we have kind of three strands to our investment strategy. Uh, Diane, um, oh, I know from Waze, now originally developed in uh, Israel, but uh, you guys are expanding all over the place, and you're you know, looking fondly at China, I think, aren't you, at yeah, Waze? Yeah, a little bit. Um, uh, do you want me to just go ahead. Or do you want to keep asking yeah. the question? No, just, just <laughs> okay. well, Diane and I seem to find each other on the same We're panel on the same all panels, the time. Especially this week. So yeah. I'm, I'm starting running out of things to ask you. Just, just okay. go. So I, I make an app, and the application uh, crowdsources uh, navigation, real time traffic, and tries to get people uh, out of traffic jams and to their destination or to their jobs faster. Uh, and we have 13 million drivers around the world. Uh, and we're collecting their GPS traces, timestamps, and then turning that into the traffic. So it's all entirely crowdsourced. It started in Israel, and um, we had, I don't know, 100,000 people or so driving, and we thought that was a success. And we thought, how can we replicate this around the world? Is there a potential for value? And what we realized soon after is that traffic is a global phenomenon. It's a global problem. It's something that everybody hates, whether you're in China or Malaysia or San Francisco, wherever you are. Uh, and so our challenge was just to continue to provide a service and, and localize as much as possible with partners so that we could uh, expand globally. Today, we're uh, probably most popular in the US, in Israel, France, Italy, Latin America, and we just raised another round of, uh, of financing at the end of last year, uh, and Li Kaxing was one of the investors, and we're going very big into China uh, and some other countries in Asia. We just announced Japan yesterday. Uh, as well, and that requires a lot more localization um, because, for example, I think that our app is now in 22 languages and it's all been uh, created by the crowd as well. A lot of those have been submitted, the, the local languages, by users of the service. So that's allowed us to be, um, to allow, allow us to have the service in the local languages easily. Um, China is a different beast altogether, which a lot of you probably know, where we're only allowed to own 49% of the company. We're building our first data center. Everything else has been in the cloud, but we own a map. We're creating a map as well, and so you're not allowed to take that information out of China. So it, it's, it's a very different proposition, and, and we're spending a lot more effort in China than we've had to anywhere else in the world. But uh, you basically grew on, on the basis of viral growth, didn't you? You didn't have to go and talk to a carrier and get on deck or anything like that. No. In fact, you know, we had this idea that wouldn't it be cool if, but, we, you know, being featured on uh, the, the App Store or Android market has been much more effective for us, I think, in terms of user growth than 
uh, working with, with a carrier and taking the time. What we did do was in the beginning, we spoke to some carriers and let them know what we were up to and they all have their own navigation systems. But now that we have so much traction in the marketplace, the carriers are coming to us. And so the conversations we started two years ago and thought, wouldn't it be cool if let's not make an investment in this are starting to become more fruitful. But we just went out and did what we, we thought we needed to do to build a business, but entirely viral. There have been a few things that have helped our growth um, and, and they also translate globally, uh, which is, for example, um, we, because we're crowdsourced, we have traffic information in real time from anywhere people are driving, which is unlike the traditional sensors in the road uh, where you're only getting information on highways. So TV news stations use us every morning for uh, the local, local traffic reports and they're getting surface street data which they never had before and they're getting audience engagement because people are making reports and they can show the person uh, on the screen and, and you know, maybe even have a photograph of the accident or the incident. And that is applicable. We're now doing those kinds of partnerships with broadcasters and, and auto manufacturers and our other kinds of partners uh, around the world. Thanks. Um, turning to Stefan, um, it, when you're thinking of the rest of the world, you, I would say you're pretty much at the sharp end, as it were, because uh, the very the you're uh, doing a heck of a lot of stuff in Africa, um, building a company like Mocality. You work with MIH Internet, which is a, a big media company. Probably the, it's, it's kind of a big media company that nobody's heard of, isn't it? It's, it, it it's I think, depending on the share price, it's the third largest media company in the world that no one in this room will have heard of apart from Neil over there because uh, <laughs> uh, we only do um, emerging and developing markets. So we own a big chunk of Tencent in China, we own a bunch of stuff in South America, um, we own a bunch of stuff in Eastern Europe and Russia and, and, um, and, and uh, all over the place. But like when they hired me, um, I'd never heard of the company. Um, but I'm based in... in um, Cape Town, Nairobi, and Lagos, and uh, I'm responsible All at for, once? Uh, about a week each <laughs> in a continuous cycle. Um, and uh, I've been, uh, so Dealfish is a classified advertising platform. Mocality is a local business directory, which we created using a crowdsource model because you know, if you're gonna build a Yelp in the US, you just go to the post office and you buy a database of every business, and then you know, that's how you start. Um, if you wanna do that in Kenya or Nigeria, no such databases exist. So um, we uh, essentially had a paid crowdsourcing model where anyone with a phone could become an agent for us and they could go and add listings and take photos. And then um, uh, using, a, someone was talking in the previous session that there was no, um, not much innovation happening in financial institutions. In Kenya, there's a platform called M-Pesa, uh, which is basically um, uh, cash on your mobile phone uh, that since it launched in 2007, now, cash equivalent to about 35% of Kenyan GDP is flowing through that system every month. And uh, I was in the mobile money session yesterday, 75% of the unbanked in Kenya do an in-pace or in transaction every day. So um, there's a huge amount of, uh, of innovation happening in Kenya um, and uh, also in Nigeria to a degree. Um, uh, a lot of it is being powered by, if people talk about Android versus iPhone, um, uh, I was at a meeting in Kenya where um, Bob Collymore, the head of Safaricom, asked, you know, who's got a Windows phone? Who's got a Windows phone? Yeah, about the same number of one hands. One person at the About the same number of hands went up, and then he said, who's got Is an iPhone? Is it the 41 megapixel one? No. Who's, who's, who's got an iPhone? And in Kenya, like, uh, and maybe two hands went up, and one of them was mine, and then he said, who's got an Android phone? And every single, like, 95% of the hands in the room went up. So if you're looking at in Kenya. In Kenya. And now, that does, now this is in a room full of techies. This isn't like in the general population, but this is, um, the, I don't want to plug Huawei too much. This is the Huawei IDEOS. This is a uh, $75 Android smartphone. Uh, and they've sold 350,000 of these in Kenya uh, in like the last six months. Um, and it's the best selling smartphone. It's one of the best selling phones in the market. And there is nothing my iPhone can do that this can't do. Um, this just has a crappier screen. Um, and this is going to be the device, or devices similar to this are going to be the ones that, 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 that make the internet and everything that we do explode in Kenya and Nigeria. Well, fascinating. Um, we are, I'm not sure how much time we've got ref, left for the panel. Did about five, ten minutes. <laughs> okay, yeah. but well, let's, if you've got a question or a point you want to ra raise, then you know, do it soon, <laughs> basically. Okay. And um, 
But uh, uh, just just to sort of go for go for a little bit of the, the subject, everybody anybody take this. You know, um, why are we here? Question. You know, why are we here? Why are we in Mobile Co World Congress? Because I'm trying to figure this out. Um, it's the existential Mobile World Congress panel. I, 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 I mean, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I've barely I've barely been at Mobile World Congress. I've been to all the side events. It's kind of like a fringe festival. It's like the Edinburgh Fringe. And uh, all the interesting stuff is happening outside of the damn main event. Um, yeah, but all of our meetings are happening inside the FIRA. Ah, right, That's there you go. <laughs> the meetings yeah. are happening there. But, um, but is, it, is it relevant? I mean, just, just one second. You know, the, the, you know, the simple question of the App Store economy you know, what's the point in doing Mobile World Congress anymore when it's this sort of massive world level playing field, ways totally viral, you, don't, you didn't need to talk to carriers until, you know, you were big, basically, so. Yeah, but now it's an incredible opportunity for us. I right. mean, imagine if we're preloaded and, you know, all of the, our major countries, it's, it's our, it could be a next big growth opportunity. And while we, we tend to take the easy route, where there's an opportunity, we pursue it. And right now, there seems to be an opportunity for us with the carriers. We've, we've worked with Telefonica in uh, some of the Latin American countries, and um, it, it, it gives us a much, much bigger um, platform. The other thing is that particularly with Android, most of the carriers are not using the Android market. They're, they're, using, they're making their own markets. And so we need to start to develop relationships there. I mean, will the App Store, will the Android market continue to uh, control the power, control the, the acceleration of the applications, I think the carriers are going to play a bigger role in that. It's still an entire ecosystem. And I think it's pretty exciting as someone on the, the, the new end of this to be able to learn more about the older world and see how they fuse together. Well, and I think, so uh, I was talking to a carrier last night and they said to me, they said, well, you know, we really want to work, so we're a traditional vendor to the, the telco space. And they said, well, we really want to work with people from the web not people from the telco space. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Of course, a carrier our team, said that. A carrier said that. And, and who, the, who was the that? Point, the, uh, I, I won't, I'm not at liberty to say. Um, <laughs> I'll get it out if you like. All of the carriers have that person now that's they, out there trying to identify the, the newer company. Yeah, well, and it's not just, it's not even just to, they want to identify because they want to they wanna partner. Um, they want to use your technology. They also want to learn. I mean, every carrier that I know has an innovation group, and they're trying to do something, whether it's you know, AT&T's Foundry or, or Telefonica Digital, or, and they're trying to figure out how to innovate. How do they act? How do they move quickly? How do they, how do they still provide differentiated value? And they want to not only you know, look to acquire or partner with startups, but learn from them. Um, you know, most carriers can't deliver something sooner than 18 months from the time they conceive it to delivering it. Whereas you go to a startup and you know maybe 18 days later you can have something. So th they are trying to figure right. out how they get to that model. So that's why they're here is to actually meet all of these younger companies. Well, they'll still come and talk to, to traditional vendors. Their goal is actually to meet the startups. I hesitate to ask why Telefonica is at Mobile World Congress, but... Uh, it's well. in Barcelona, so right. it's very <laughs> easy to get to for most of the employees. <laughs> ah. <laughs> It, no, I, I mean, in fairness, it's a great opportunity. I mean, you know, no matter we can beat the carriers to death, and and you know, we, we, we're very humble, and 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 I'm sure, you know, what we're trying to do is look at what we can do to change it. We still have a customer base of 300 million customers that we can access, and we we can help companies to get to, and we need to make sure that our company is joined up and is 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 providing things that allow those companies to get to us quicker. And you know, one of the people in the audience is. How can we build APIs that allow people, you know, and startups to integrate with all of our systems much quicker? Those are the kind of things that we can join together in the old and the new world by being here. I think it's an interesting debate, and I think it'll be interesting to see what happens next year when the venue moves, actually. So I, I think the Mobile World Congress thing is a, a, a bigger debate. Yeah, I only ask that the carriers don't create anything new for us to have to develop or integrate into. It's hard enough just with all the new Android fragmentation. <laughs> Say that again. Yeah, yeah. Um, any point? We're, trying, we're trying to make it easier. We're trying to make it easier. We're trying to make it easier. Q and A. Michael, just we'll get you a mic. No, I was. I just wanted to react on the um, uh, 18 months versus 18 days uh, uh, time to market. Um, unfortunately, they even if they want to do it in uh, 18 days, which will they never they will never be able to do it. Uh, they can do it only on products that are evolution of their current product. 
that address the needs of their current customers because they, they have basically a balance sheet, they have structures, they, they, they need to pay their bills. Uh, if you want to go and find a revolution product, the one that kill your business, you will never get there. I'm sorry to say. Well, no, so there's, there's two things that are happening, right, in parallel. So, so one, they do need to <coughs> leverage and continue to extend their, their existing networks and drive value from that, right? That's millions and billions, I should say billions and billions of dollars of investment. It's not cheap, right? Um, at LTE, so in emerging markets, as new LTE infrastructure goes up, it's a great opportunity to start with that platform as an entirely API-based platform. Just like as a startup, you guys start out building a product and you build it all based on APIs. We're watching people across emerging markets when they build an LTE network saying, I want it to be all web-enabled when I go out the door. Um, which removes a layer of abstraction so that they can put that security layer. A lot of reasons they can't go to market quickly, it's security and it's regulation, right? Um, even us as a vendor selling a product to them to give them that layer to abstract the, the security infrastructure, we actually have to go and get it uh, certified and get it audited uh, by the NSA, right? There's, there's, there's complications in the, in the network level, so they actually have to bring it up. They'll never get to 18 days. Uh, they might get to 45 to 60 days, but you have to have that abstraction. And to your point, um, I think there's a, a reason uh, why you'll see companies in parallel, as, as Telefonica is doing, is saying, we have stuff we need to build on our old technology, because we want to leverage it, take advantage of it, there's value in the network, and oh, by the way, we're going to start a whole new separate thing here, right? It might be on a whole different platform. Um, it might be with a whole different set of partners, but we're seeing that trend happen, where it's, I got this network and I got this stuff going on, but I'm gonna build something new. I mean, AT&T just announced a, um, a couple of months ago at their developer conference, uh, they're building a cloud infrastructure based on OpenStack. Who would have thought AT&T would do that? And they're contributing code back to OpenStack, right? Different model than what they had in the past. Any other questions or points? Uh, yes, hello, uh, this is uh, another hello. question. There you are. Uh, well, uh, I worked for five years as a system architect of IPTV in Telefonica, and then I moved to uh, I Alcatel Lucent for my view TV. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay, what, what's the question? Yeah, and then I had Ask my own. Two <laughs> I found my own startup for doing software for TV. So my question is: uh, Is really Alcatel and Telefonica uh, giving opportunity to small companies in the valley? F because here, in Spain, uh, what happens is. Uh, if you are not a company with uh, at least uh, 50 uh, people working for you, uh, it's very difficult they would even pay attention to you. you know? uh, it's, it's really difficult to get into the interest of big companies, even though you can have a nice product because uh, applications are today very small. You know? It's a typical startup question. Take yeah, those at me. <laughs> It, and it's a, you know, it is a challenge. I'm not going to say that it's easy for every company who wants to engage with Telefonica. What we're trying to do is create the vehicles to make that easier for a startup to engage. So me being in Silicon Valley with my team is, is an effort to kind of provide that you know, interface into Telefonica so that I can deal with the, you know, the numbers of people and try and guide people into the right parts of the organization and also make direct investments. And where we make a direct investment, we make a big commitment to making that relationship work. And then the smaller you get with the, the wire type organization, we're talking about two, three people startup organizations, not a 50 to 100 uh, you know, organization. So we're trying to create those vehicles. And you have an incubator in Madrid, so there's one here. Yeah, as well. yeah and Barcelona, yeah. And Barcelona. Oh. Uh, yeah, we have, we have. Last question. Oh, I'll just take the next one. Hi, Martin Kuhl from The Cool Room. Um, I just moved to Switzerland and spent a lot of time working at Skype prior to the Microsoft acquisition. Didn't want to work for the big boys. Um, Switzerland is obsessed with the valley, and it seems to be, like, coming to Stefan's point, there's a real unhealthy obsession with looking to the west, and really the opportunities are to Africa and to the east. How do we get the mindset um, of the mobile industry maybe to look towards emerging markets rather than this obsession with iPhone and Android all so, the time. So I think I come here every year mainly to evangelize and point out that you know, if, you, if you look at the telcos, you know, all the telcos say all our, all our growth is going to come from emerging markets for like the next five, ten years. Now, almost nothing is going to come uh, that will really materially affect their share price in the developed world. But you come to Mobile World Congress and there's me and like a few other guys <laughs> in the GSMA, you know, developing world fringe events um, saying, look, why aren't you paying attention to this? Um, 
and I don't know why it is. I mean, it seems you know. I mean, there's there's all the all the shiny shiny stuff is nice, but it's well, it's, it's immediate it's revenue, right? Right. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Well, there, it's immediate revenue. There is a big contingent but, of government people though that are here this, from emerging markets that are actually here, walking around, talking to people, meeting people, trying trying to figure out how they promote it, just like you are evangelizing, you know, the the developer ecosystem in Kenya, right? Which is very well known and has produced a lot of great applications and. Nigeria, who's trying to do the same thing, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, Personally, I blame the, the fucking media myself. <laughs> I, I was a judge at the Mobile Premier about bloody Awards the other shiny day. shiny devices. And Gosh. there were there were twenty apps presented from around the world, and three of them were for Af from Africa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and similarly, I think we're, we're, you know we're looking to support Latin America. The Wire concept actually started as a Latin American initiative, and has then been brought to Europe. So it's come from emerging to. to I personally think that everybody should just continue to obsess about Silicon Valley <laughs> and then all of you guys can do, go and do great businesses. Uh, Mike, I just could right to the very last question. Last question. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, I'm with Key Capital. We're uh, a micro VC based in the Bay Area, but we invest globally. So the question is actually to Deanne. I mean, the orthodoxy in the Valley has been we need to be within 20 to 30 miles of all our investees for proximity. We don't, we don't believe in that. We don't think that's the right way. We look at companies all around the world, China, etc. Um, how does a startup see that? Would you go with an investor that actually doesn't care about proximity um, and then finds other ways of helping you guys or not? I care about the quality of the investor uh, more than anything else. And quite frankly, the quality of the investors in the Valley is very high. Um, and not just because they have more money, but because they've done this a million times, because they walk down your hall and they can smell if your engineer is not executing very well, because when I drop my kids off at school, I do a deal with the, you know, a classmate's dad who happens to run Nintendo. I mean, there's a whole ecosystem there that I think that the rest of the world needs to look at not moving to the valley, not necessarily even competing with the valley, but how do you take advantage of the valley? How do you take advantage of that ecosystem? We're a 75 person company, most of the entire team is in Israel. There are only seven or eight of us in the, in the valley. Uh, but that's enough to take advantage of the ecosystem. Uh, so quality of investment and, and what relevance they have to our experience. Yeah. Thank but you very much. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much.